President Biden took a late night flight, starting a trip to the Middle East. This trip will reinforce a vital American role in a strategically consequential region. That's National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan. Israel is the first stop. Then the president will go to the West Bank and meet with the Palestinian president. He'll also go to Saudi Arabia. The president believes that the price of gas is too high and that we need to do more with respect to global energy supplies. And he will take every step in his power, both here at home and in terms of his diplomatic engagement in the world, to try to bring that about. Now, President Biden will not be going to Iran, but that country will certainly be part of the discussions. What they have said they're trying to do is to build out a coalition to push back against Iran. Former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo is now a Fox News contributor. But what they've done has been just the opposite of that. They've allowed the Iranian regime to have wealth and resources and money. The Iranians are now, according to National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan, going to provide drones for the Russians to kill more Ukrainians. They've pushed away our friends, our partners in Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, calling them a pariah nation. And then it sounds like the president is going to uh, visit what, what he would call the West Bank and go visit the Palestinians uh, when he should be working with the Israeli government to push back against Iran, to support the Israelis, to, to make clear that Jerusalem is the capital, right? Uh, something that they've pushed back against, saying we're going to put our consulate in Jerusalem as well, a consulate inside the country of Israel. The words that they've used about what they're hoping to accomplish on this trip are deeply inconsistent with the actions they have taken in their first first 18 months in office. Are right, you talk about Iran. The president in a Washington Post op-ed wrote that after my predecessor reneged on a nuclear deal that was working, Iran passed a law mandating the rapid acceleration of the nuclear program, blaming the acceleration on the U.S. pulling out of that deal. And then he wrote the United States States found itself isolated and alone by that decision. What's your response? It's counterfactual, Paul. Uh, you, you pick the description. I might just always turn to facts. Iran has never been more isolated. I can prove it. Their economy was failing, and the uh, Biden administration came in, lifted the sanctions that we'd had in place by seeking to tell everyone we're not going to enforce them. That is, a wink and a nod. Uh, and the Iranian economy will grow this year. This year, the Ukrainian economy will grow faster than the American economy. And so if you're looking for the path forward, uh, you need only ask the Israelis, the Emiratis, the Kuwaitis, the Omanis, the Israelis, frankly, the American people as well. Uh, we had isolated in Iran that they had never been isolated before. We had denied them the wealth and resources to build out their nuclear program as they have done over these last 18 months where it has accelerated. This creates enormous risk for the American people and for the Israelis, our good friend and partner in the region, and that is dangerous. Now, Vladimir Putin, the Russian leader, he will go to Iran next week, and he's going to have meetings with not just Iran's leader, but also the president of Turkey, Erdogan. Turkey is a NATO member. What do you make of this trip? So it's always been a complicated relationship. I hope that President Erdogan is going there to tell the Russians and the Iranians uh, that they need to change their ways. I doubt that that's uh, going to be successful for him. We'll have to see what comes from the meeting, but make no mistake about it. If one looks to make sure that we don't have to send our young kids to fight and die in the Middle East, something that for four years we prevented from happening in the Trump administration. If you want to keep our kids from having to go solve problems in the Middle East, the way to do that is to put pressure on the world's largest state sponsor, Terry, the Iranian regime, to support the Iranian people. Today, there are protesters protesting in the streets of Iran, and the administration hasn't even encouraged them, hasn't even supported them. They'll likely be bludgeoned by the Iranian leaders. We should support the Iranian people, oppose the Iranian theocracy, and help our Arab state allies have the resources they need to defend their own nations. President Biden's plan to go to Saudi Arabia is not without controversy. He'll meet with the king and the crown prince, Mohammed bin Salman, who the CIA concluded ordered the 2018 murder of Washington Post columnist Jamal Khashoggi. During a presidential debate on MSNBC November 20th, 2019, then-candidate Joe Biden said he would punish the Saudis. I would make it very clear we were not going to, in fact, sell more weapons to them. We were going to, in fact, make them pay the price and make them, in fact, the pariah that they are. In 2018, 
2018, Secretary of State Pompeo called the murder heinous, but urged the Senate not to condemn the crown prince, saying it would upend a plan to stop the Saudi conflict with rebels in Yemen. Passing a resolution at this point undermines that. It would encourage the Houthis. It would encourage the Iranians. It would. It would undermine the gradual agreement. Well, the Senate ultimately did pass that resolution condemning the crown prince. The Kingdom of Saudi Arabia has been an important security partner for the United States of America for an awfully long time. And if you go actually read what the CIA said, it's a bit different than you described it. Okay. But be that but be that as it may, the importance of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia is evidenced by the fact that Joe Biden is headed there this week. The President Biden is headed there this week. He sees that he made a mistake when he campaigned by saying we're going to make them a pariah state. The threat to the people of America. We put America first for four years. The threat to the United States States of America doesn't come from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia or from the Emirates or from Kuwait or Oman. The threat to the United States of America comes from the Iranian regime. And we should be resolved and focused and be working with our partners in the region to push back to protect the American people from that very threat. Okay, well, what about the human rights issues? What about something, the the issue like with Khashoggi, like with the Crown Prince? There's still a lot of emphasis on him and what happens with with human rights in Saudi Arabia, how do you have them as a partner and still deal with that issue at the same time like President Biden says he's going to do? Uh, this is not difficult at all. Uh, America's interest and our commitment to human rights is consistent. Uh, we're, the, we're the greatest, most fundamentally decent nation in the world. But we end up meeting with Chairman Kim. I met with Vladimir Putin. I met with the Taliban. We, we deal with lots of actors in the world who are difficult and angry and don't share our values. That's we're working to deliver good outcomes for the American people. We should never lose sight of that. If you're looking for who the bad actor is in the Middle East, the Iranians have killed far more people than the Saudis ever could have even be accused of, right? This is not a close call. And President Biden talks about the Middle East and fails to even so much as mention Afghanistan, where we left Americans behind. We always press for every nation to be better. And in fact, the kingdom of Saudi Arabia is getting better under the leadership of this king and now this crown prince. The human rights situation in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia is far better for the average woman in Saudi Arabia today than it was two years ago, four years ago, or ten years ago. It may not be happening fast enough. We may wish that it were uh, even better, but I don't think there anyone can look at the Saudi Arabia of today and deny that the human rights situation in Saudi Arabia is better today for the average Saudi citizen than it was before the crown prince had become the crown prince. Of course, President Biden is going to be discussing with uh, the Saudis and others in that region the issue of oil. We have seen the price of oil and gasoline come down in the last month or so, but it's still an issue with the ongoing war in Ukraine, with Russia and the sanctions. What do you think the president should say? We know what the real cause of this problem is. It is not the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. It is not Vladimir Putin. It is President Biden. President Biden made a clear decision. He talked in the campaign about saying we're not going to do fossil fuels in the United States anymore. We're not going to drill. We're not going to frack. He said we're not going to do it. When you tell and be told banks don't invest in these things, don't help finance these transactions that allow us to produce our own energy. For four years, America was energy dominant. We had affordable energy so people could drive their cars, so people could afford the, the electricity to cool their homes in the summer and heat their homes in the winter. Food wasn't as expensive because energy is a huge component of food costs as well. This president has chosen the green climate mantra. He has chosen Greta Thunberg over the American people. And when you do that, the American people are going to suffer. And so, you know, I hope he'll be able to convince OPEC and the King of Saudi Arabia to produce some more energy. But the, the answer to providing affordable energy for the American people is right here at home. And he ought to get his tail back here. You got to come back to the United States of America and tell the political, the progressive left inside his own party that our dream was a lie, that with this transition away from fossil fuels is going to take time and that America is going to produce the energy it needs on an affordable basis today to protect the American way of life. But the price of gas did go up more than a dollar after the invasion of Ukraine. Russia is still in the middle of that war. We put sanctions on them. Do you agree with the sanctions we put on Russia? Should we be doing more? 
oh, no, we've gotten it completely wrong. The, the ruble's still very, very high. We've failed to impose sanctions on them that actually can impact what we all want. We all want this war to end. We are looking for a way to make this conflict vanish, to save the Ukrainian people's lives, to protect Europe, and to protect the American people as well. We've put sanctions on that are half measures. The, the ruble is as high today as it was when the war started back in February. We, we know that people in Moscow aren't suffering, right? They, they've not been impacted. But it just tells you that these sanctions haven't, haven't been successful at putting pressure on Vladimir Putin. We should have been more serious. We should have provided more weapon systems to the Ukrainians so they could defend themselves. Had we done those things, we would have increased the likelihood that Vladimir Putin's perception of risk, as it was for four years. When I was the CIA director and secretary of state for four years, he did not invade Ukraine. He took Crimea during the Obama administration. He's now invaded Ukraine under the Biden administration. But for four years, he didn't do this. I think it's because he understood that we were serious about protecting America. All right. You mentioned uh, Secretary of State, CIA director. I have to ask you, you're also, of course, a member of Congress from Kansas. Not a bad presidential resume. Is that a job that you want? Are you seriously considering a run? I'm very focused on making sure that the conservative ideas that I've been working on for decades get pushed forward. The next chance to do that is in November, just a handful of months away. So I'm out helping others campaign. At the end of the year, Susan and I will pray and think and make a decision about how best we can do a good turn for a country that's been so good to both of us. And uh, who, who knows what that will bring. Uh, I've spent time in Iowa and New Hampshire uh, doing the things that one might do. We'll, we'll make that decision come first of the year. All right. One follow-up I have to ask. If Donald Trump is a candidate, would you run? We won't be impacted by who else chooses to get in or, or chooses not to get in in that very important, very faithful decision that uh, every individual has to make for themselves. Well, fair enough, and I, and I appreciate you, you, you answering both those questions. Thank you very much. Former Secretary of State, current Fox News contributor, Mike Pompeo, good to talk to you. Thank you so much.